Hey guys, Jared Beckwith here. Today I'm at the ASSEC conference in Phoenix and I gave my speech on the future of EEG monitoring and the impact of all these new AI advancements. So I didn't have my brother or my mom, my parents here to record my speech. So I'll just redo it here for you guys on YouTube. Thank you all for watching and here's my talk. Welcome everyone. Today we're gonna get into the future of EEG monitoring and the impact of AI advancements. Why listen to me? I'm a registered EEG technologist and I've been building my own EEG machine powered by AI named ION with my brother and dad, so I kind of know where the field is going. Let's go back to the beginning of computer science where one of the founders, Alan Turing, proposed to consider the question, can machines think? In order to determine this, Alan Turing came up with a test based on something called the imitation game. Now in this game, you have the person on the right who's an interviewer, and they ask questions to the two people behind a curtain, one of which is a woman and the other is a man. Now the goal of the interviewer on the right is to determine which one's the man and which one's the woman, and the goal of the two behind the curtain are to trick the interviewer so he gets it wrong. The Turing test was very similar where you had one interviewer on the right and on the other side of the curtain, you'd have one human and one computer. Now the goal of the interviewer is to try and ask questions to determine which one's the human and which one's the computer. And Alan Turing hypothesized that if at some point humans could not distinguish between a human and a computer, then we could in fact assume that machines have the ability to think if they're able to do exactly what humans can do. With all these new advancements in AI, things like ChatGPT, other large language models, researchers from Stanford found that they actually passed the Turing test. Now, this is a landmark moment in AI history because this test was set up all the way back in 1951. Now let's look at our specific field. Even though we're EEG techs, not EKG techs, it's true that innovations in EKG always end up happening in EEG years later. In the 1960s, we had the invention of the first ambulatory EKG Holter monitor. The first version was really big with a backpack, but they eventually made a smaller version, which made it more practical, and patients have been getting EKGs ever since. In the 1980s, we had the first ambulatory EEG monitor. Now it takes a little longer for innovations in EEG because we have more electrodes in our test compared to EKG, so the data size is bigger, so technology takes a little while to catch up. In the 1980s, they also started doing centralized EKG telemetry monitoring, so you'd have multiple patients in the ICU hooked up to EKG, and in one centralized area, they would monitor the heartbeats of all their ICU patients and notify the doctors if there's any abnormal heart rhythms. In the early 2000s, with the invention of digital EEG, we also had increased hard drive space. It actually became really practical to do continuous EEG monitoring with video. So this brought some new good things, but also some drawbacks. Some pros are that we're able to continuously monitor for status epilepticus, which is just constant seizures. We're also able to assess the ongoing treatment of seizures in critically ill patients in the ICU. And this gives us the ability to actually monitor for cerebral ischemia, which is actually stroke. So very amazing new capabilities, but it came with some new challenges. Every 24 hours creates over 8,000 pages of data for the neurologist to review for every patient. And you know they're gonna have multiple patients. So I also found that it takes about 38 minutes to review 24 hours of EEG. A way that we combat this in the present day is through what is called quantitative EEG. We take the traditional EEG waveforms, the squiggly lines, and we turn them into colors. And the reason for doing that is we're able to display a lot more data on one page. For this example, it shows 30 minutes of data and three distinct flame seizures. So instead of taking 38 minutes to review an EEG, one study found it takes only eight minutes. Now, who should learn quantitative EEG? If you're just doing routine studies in a doctor's office, only 20 or 30 minutes, it's probably not worth your time to learn quantitative EEG. Just because it's so short, 
you can easily scroll through the traditional EEG recording. But if you're doing continuous monitoring of long-term studies, the time that it saves you over your entire career, if you take just a small amount of time to learn quantitative EEG, it'll save you so much time over your career, you'll be glad I told you to learn it. Uh, it's also important to understand the limitations of quantitative EEG. For example, if you have a very short seizure, maybe 10 or 15 seconds, it may not show up very well on the quantitative EEG trends just because it's so short. Also, singular interictal discharges may not show up as well. Now, it's also important to understand AI artifact reduction filter limitations. So in this recording, we have kind of grayed out was the original signal where the patient had rhythmic chewing, but underneath the signal at the bottom, we can see that they're having a right temporal seizure. Now, even though there's still a little muscle artifact, even despite the filter, it's not perfect. You got to understand that, but it's working well enough to where we can see clearly the seizure at the bottom of the page. And even though it filters out some brain activity, very small percentage, it's way less than the traditional high frequency filter of 30 Hertz or 15 Hertz that doctors used in the past. Now let's look at the modern AI analysis of EKG recordings. So I found that AI analysis of EKG seems to be about on par with your average cardiologist. So it seems better than a new doctor, but worse than a super experienced cardiologist. So it's pretty much on human level. If we look at the modern AI analysis of continuous EEG, there was an Ivy League study in 2022. They looked at a company named Persist and they found they detected seizures in 5,000 out of 7,000 records that did not contain any seizures. They also found that a human reader would have to read 12 and a half studies with automated detections to find just one with true seizures. While present day AI seizure detectors are actually quite primitive, we can expect them to catch up to EKG and get to human level status, let's say in the 2030s. In 2021, when I was brainstorming about the future of EEG, I thought in 10 years, we'll no longer process EEGs for neurologists and it's automatically gonna be done by an artificial neural network. But, I can say now that I'm more experienced, it's 2024, I've changed my mind on the subject. Instead of having AI detection systems completely replace our thinking, we're going to use them to stimulate our own thinking, and it's going to be more of a collaborative process between AI and the humans monitoring, the EEG techs and the neurologist. We're going to collaborate with AI kind of like a jury and come to a common conclusion together, a verdict. Now, someone a long time ago did the math to determine what is the optimal number of jurors to have in order to have the highest probability of coming to the correct decision. In their case, either guilty or not guilty, or in our case, seizure or not seizure. And they found if each individual juror has more than a 50% chance of being correct, the more people individuals you add to the jury, the higher likelihood you have of coming to the correct decision. They also found that if the probability of each juror of being correct is less than 50%, then adding them to the jury actually makes things worse. So AI makes a lot of mistakes, probably less than 50% correct. So for now, let's leave it out. Maybe it can help us out in the 2030s. That begs the question, are EEG technologists correct more than 50% of the time? Well, there's a study done on seizure sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is you show someone a seizure and they correctly identify it as a seizure. Specificity is you show someone not a seizure and they correctly identify it as not a seizure. So looking at registered EEG techs, they averaged out at a 71% seizure detection sensitivity. Not bad. CLTM techs did a little better with 81% sensitivity, but interestingly enough, techs with no registry still had a 67% sensitivity at seizure detection, and they only had one or two years experience. Amazing. And if you look at specificity, pretty good all across the board. 
In the 2030s, this is how the process of seizure detection is going to go down. We're going to monitor more patients than we do now, and it's going to be constantly monitored and reviewed by AI detection algorithms. Let's say they're at human level status in the 2030s, and they have 80% accuracy. They come up with a detection, then that notifies the EEG monitoring tech. We look at it, make sure it's not excessive artifact trick in the AI, make sure it's not something like a normal variant trick in the AI, and then once we make our annotations for the doctor, send it off to the doctor, and let's say they have 80% accuracy, and they can make their decision. Through this process of blending three minds into one, the mind of the artificial intelligence, the mind of the EEG tech, and the mind of the doctor, it'll be very hard in the future to miss any seizures. And once AI is at human level status, I think we'll essentially solve seizure detection. And doctors can focus on treating their patients and will no longer have to worry about missing any detections. To end my talk, I just have one more thing. I wanted to make a prediction for the year 2100, very far in the future. Where is the field of brains, computers, electrodes? Where is all this going? Alan Turing, one of the founders of computer science that we talked about at the beginning of this talk, he said, once the machine thinking method has started, it's not going to take long for them to essentially surpass us. And once we no longer have the smartest brains on the planet, we're going to have to give up control to the machines. It could be a good thing if they treat us well, and it also could be a bad thing. What is it that gives us human beings complete control over all the other animals on the planet? Well, we're not more ferocious than something like a lion, we're not stronger than the lion, we don't have sharper teeth than the lion, but what we do have is a better brain than the lion. If we look at the evolution of the human brain over the past few million years, it has steadily grown in size, and with each increase in size, we've gotten new abilities. For example, two million years ago, we started using tools, and if we look at the present day, our brains now gives us the amazing things like language, art, science, music, all the stuff we know and love, it's made possible by our amazing brains. Now, in the future, I expect our brains to continue to grow in size, not with more biological neurons, but instead artificial neurons that we add on top of our existing brains, allowing us for expanded brain capacity and abilities. Now, what is that going to look like in the year 2100 and beyond? The main change that an artificial layer of neurons will bring to us is increased communication speed. But let's look at the speed today. Currently, if humans want to communicate something to another human, we do it through language. We have a thought in our head, and we put it into language, and then we speak it with our vocal cords. 50,000-year-old technology, but it works all right. When humans want to communicate something to a computer, the purple bar there, we do it through typing on our laptops or with our thumbs on our phone. So let's say we want to know the 16th president of the United States. We'll take out our phones, open up Google, and with our thumbs, type it all out. That's really slow, especially compared to the speed of thought, which is the orange bar. That's your internal dialogue, a human thinking with itself, super fast, the speed of thought. And the green bar is the speed of computers communicating things to humans. Now, they do that through displaying us text after you do your Google search about the 16th president. The top result on Google will show you a picture of Abraham Lincoln with some text about him. Now, that's a lot faster than us typing to computers and faster than us talking, but definitely slower than our speed of thought. When humans in the future have a digital layer of brain, we're going to be able to communicate with other humans, the blue bar, brain to brain communication at the speed of thought. We'll no longer talk using language, we'll communicate purely by our thoughts. Now we have the purple bar when you want to communicate something to a computer. Let's say you have the thought, you want to know the 16th president. Instead of typing it out on a phone or a laptop, the computer will get your request immediately. And then if we look at the green bar, the computer will be able to send you the information that it is Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president, at the speed of thought, essentially giving us access to all information that humans have recorded over our entire history 
almost instantaneously. Now, it wouldn't be all stored in our biological brains because it couldn't hold it all, but if you ever need to know something, your digital brain can download it. With the ability for direct brain-to-brain -brain communication and also direct brain-to-computer communication, we'll essentially have telepathy. Now, the founder of EEG, Hans Berger, he was on a quest to discover telepathy. So he ended up recording the first EEG. But unfortunately, when he recorded these brainwaves, he found out that there's no way these brainwaves can be traveling across super large distances. So he actually disproved his original hypothesis of telepathy existing. So he got really upset, ended up committing suicide later in life. Mm, terrible, guys. But I think he'd be very pleased to know with the new advancements of computers, AI, if we can get advancements in very small microelectrodes, if we can get improved neurosurgical techniques so we can add a digital layer of brain relatively non-invasively, we're going to be able to have what his dream was, and that is telepathy, direct brain-to-brain -brain communication and direct brain-to-computer communication. Thank you guys for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, leave them in the YouTube comments. I know I talked about a lot of interesting stuff, especially this future stuff. I think we got a bright future ahead of us. And you can also email me if you have questions as well. Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe if you're on YouTube, and I'll see you guys on the next video.